we'll just uh, be waiting for a few seconds. Yeah. So that everyone can join and we can start. Okay, let's uh, start the session. So, hello, uh, good day, everyone. I am Japanese Singh, your host for this session. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lavina Ramchandani. Lavina is not only a passionate test manager with a decade of experience, but also a true community leader for data science testing and testing in general. Today, she'll be talking about strategies and policies to ensure the quality of data science models and also guide us through the measuring of accuracy of models to ensure the customer is benefited from the models. But before we move on, I have a few suggestions, uh, suggestions for you guys. Show your love with the, uh, for the topic by using the emojis and at the end of session, we'll be uh, taking questions. So feel free to drop your questions in QA section. So please join me in welcoming uh, Lavanya, uh, Lavina. Uh, over to you, Lavina. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. And um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, let me know, Japneet, when you can see it. Oh, yes, uh, we can yes. see yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So let's get started. So welcome to my talk on testing a data science model. Um, it's a very interesting topic. It's something that I fell into as well. Um, I had no idea what data science was all about. And then my project that I was uh, bought into was all based on modeling and everything. So I thought it would be really interesting for those of you who are interested to kind of get in this area. What things are useful to think about and uh, some tips to take away as well if you're already working in it. So I know Japneet has uh, already introduced me, but just a little bit more. So I've graduated uh, in computer science. I fell into testing. I had no idea what testing was about. Um, I've been in the community in the community and uh, the testing world now for 10 years. I've worked in various industries, including oil and gas, transport, financial services, consumer goods, and aviation. Uh, I enjoy testing and learning from my colleagues and fellow testers. Some of my hobbies include dancing, yoga, and teaching. And um, my first ever public speaking experience was the data science talk as well. So table of contents for today. So what is a data science model is what we're going to go over first. So I will take you over some background knowledge to help you understand how to test a model, um, the process around it. So how to test the model and some takeaway uh, helpful tips and things I learned uh, from complexities. So currently 80% of UK businesses are looking to hire a data scientist or seek data consultancy. I think this uh, statistics was, um, I think a year and a bit ago. So I think right now the statistic must be slightly higher. And IBM anticipates the data science, that data science will account for 28% of all digital jobs by 2020. We are in 2023, so you know the boost it has been massive everyone's talking about data science and ai so it has increased since as well so what actually is data science so data science is a selection of tools and algorithms to um, basically show you hidden patterns from raw data it allows decisions and predictions to be made and the aim of making informed decisions for your customers so data science is more of a forward-looking approach an exploratory way with the focus on analyzing past or current data and predicting the future outcomes. So who, what, how, where, when, basically answering open-ended questions potentially. Now, what is a model? So I'd like to give you a little analogy uh, before I give you an explanation of a model. So imagine you're driving into work so the data side of things would be your driving experience. So you basically sit into your car in the morning, you put your air condition on, you put the radio on, and then you start putting your GPS and you start onto the road. So that's your data. 
basically. And then the computer side of things is your brain trying different driving patterns to learn what works best. So say, for instance, um, you reach the road and there's traffic. So you're going to kind of find a diverging route. So basically to get to work earlier. So that's your computing side of things. But maybe your system might not work in such a way that you have to be stuck in the um, traffic. So that means you need to train your model to tell you what route is best. And then the model side of thing is an equation of data inputs affecting the target value. So in this case, our model has to put in an equation to help us reach at a good time to work rather than late. So that's how the model side of things work. So in this case, the target value is how long it takes to get to work. So the sooner, the better. If it's playing up, you, that means your model needs to be trained again. So remember, the model is a statistical black box. It's more of a what if situation. So if a customer uses the parameters we suggest, the model suggests, then what their business could look like. So it's a, what if we do this, then this is what we expect. And it also uses genetic algorithms, which is, algor uh, this algorithm reflects a process of natural selection where the fittest individuals are selected. And it's inspired by Charles Darwin. Something to uh, also suggest here, Models are use probability distribution to understand the behavior of the inputs. And what we are doing as testers, we are testing against an expected outcome. So model produces some indications that are being used as guidelines today by the clients. So of course, a model needs data and we have four types of data a model can potentially use. So you have structured data, which is like Excel files. So adheres to predefined data models, easy to aggregate data from various locations as well. You've got semi-structured uh, data, which is JSON or XML files, um, basically self-describing data. Then you have unstructured uh, files, which are videos and audio. So not organized, you have to basically organize it uh, with a data engineer and um, it may have irreg irregularities as well. And then you have metadata, which provides additional information about your data set. So for example, the photographs, where, when was it taken? What date was it taken potentially? And now on your phones, you can also see where was it taken? So things like that. So what industry are using a data science model is something that I get asked a lot. So aerospace, um, it's the farthest planet from the sun. For example, um, automotive, uh, despite being red, sorry, I think I've got the wrong information there. Ignore that. I'll just tell you, aerospace is basically being used by uh, maintenance operations. Automotive, like cars and everything, they are being used for manufacturing failures, um, especially with all these hybrid cars these days, um, all like electric cars. Uh, the financial uh, services um, basically use uh, data science uh, for market trends, fraud, risk detection, um, and things like that. Energy or um, manufacturing, they are using it for demand forecasting um, to basically check how much, how much product they need to basically be able to deliver their demand. Uh, travel, for example, also, they're using dynamic pricing, predicting flight delays, for example, as well. Uh, healthcare uh, to, to basically predict diseases. And social media for digital marketing and upselling. So let's get into the details around testing now. So before we start testing, we need to have some idea of what to prepare before we test. So the things we need to focus on are the following. So always be present at requirements gathering sessions and understand the requirements. So capture what requirements we need from the clients or business. Understand what problem we are trying to solve. Then you have your design sessions where maybe the UX or UI people are sitting and designing prototypes, mainframes, front ends, uh, decide which one is the most viable one, for example, and decide uh, also Evaluate the effectiveness. If it's a front-end product, it's not just about the data science side of things. It's other things that you need to think about as well um, to see if the client will understand the wordings that we're using. Are they too technical, for example, or not? 
Um, then you have your planning side of things. As a team, plan how to implement a solution, right? So you have your design, you have your requirements, then you need to start planning to implement that. And then you have your implementation. So start the magic and deliver a working solution. So in all of this, basically, there's a major spike that you have to create. And then you have epics coming out of it. I was potentially, I was working in an agile manner. So that's why I'm using these buzzwords. And one thing that I must say is um, the Three Amigos session. I think whichever team you're in, always, always, always sit down with the data scientist and a business analyst or a product owner to basically share your thoughts share any assumptions, any ambiguities, because the model is a statistical black box. You can't really get into the details fully, right? You have to work with the model, train it to basically see what you're expecting. But let's when we move forward, I'll tell you that the model sometimes is unpredictable as well. So these are the things that I'd suggest being part of. So when it comes to testing, then a model could be off the shelf or a model could be custom made. Now, depending on which one you go for, testing should be made depending on either off the shelf or custom made. Also, considerations of how often you want to train your model is important. So how much in how much data you're going to input, how many times you're going to run the model, what are you going to learn from the outputs? This is what you need to decide with your team. Also, there's randomness in the model. When it's off the shelf model, there isn't much randomness. But when it's a custom made model, there's something called stochastic. So that means you might get certain columns of the data that re uh, return random values. They may not exactly be derivations or they might not be anomalies, but it's a way of understanding. So let me put this in an analogy for you. So five plus three for me and you is eight, but the model might come up with 8.00001. Now this, when we look at it, we might feel that, ah, this doesn't seem right. Something is off. Why is this showing me 8.0001? It should be just eight or 8.0, right? But um, initially it's looking wrong, but it's actually right. Now, what happens here is you have to, in your team, decide about a threshold, what you're going to accept and what you're going to reject. So if you are going to say five plus three in the model and it's becoming stochastic, basically you have to decide in your strategy that you can only accept the difference between 5%. So if it's 5% above the value, we will accept it. But if it's above 5% difference wise, then we completely reject and then it's definitely an anomaly. Now, this was for me uh, at Deloitte, but um, if it's a fraud detection or like a bank using this, right? 5% uh, threshold is too high. They might just put 0.5% or 1% to check what's within those limits. Because if you give higher thresholds, for certain um, areas or companies or products, it's safer. But if it's a intense, like if it's something like fraud detection or some sort of detection that will help you understand your client, your thresholds should be lower. Of, of course, it depends on each industry, uh, the critical, the industry, the lower the threshold if possible. So in terms of testing then, what are we actually going to test? So, Testing the model. So we're going to verify the data set to use for the model. We are not just going to use whatever we get given. We're going to understand the problem in that data, understand the shape of that data. What I mean by shape is not triangles, squares, or circles. What I mean is testing the outputs, basically. We'll explain if the values are of the right type and the data columns are matching or not. We want to validate the input values versus the output data results because, of course, the output can be a bit stochastic, but it may not be an anomaly. It's something that you need to decide as a team to basically put in your test strategy. Then you want to test the areas you're certain about because you know the system works like this. And then also do a bit of exploratory testing to understand the uncertain areas and understand the thresholds, like play enough with it to understand that the model can go outside this threshold and that's where we stop and we say there's a bug. 
Make sure the data pipeline works as expected because data can get leaked. So um, make sure you are not going to that extent and your data is in a safe, it's kept safely and you're using it safely as well. Test using different parameters um, because that also helps you understand the model better, what the model works faster with, what might slow down the model or what might be a medium speed for the model to return results to you and um, explore the model. Um, I know that sometimes we are so busy with our testing tickets and features and sprints that exploratory testing gets missed. I would suggest never never miss that exploratory testing out. Always uh, try and uh, give your best at exploratory testing because you never know what you might find. And there might be a bug that has been there for a long time, but um, you haven't realized. So some more around testing. So when you are testing a model, the, the two things that you're going to always see is new features and regression testing. So the best solution for new features would be to work on a test plan with a data scientist and you're testing against an expected outcome. And the data scientist, when you pair with them, they will be able to explain to you the details of a specific algorithm. And I know algorithms are intense sometimes. I know that we are not expected to learn these algorithms or know the details of it, but it's good to learn something about it. Consult your results with a data scientist for conciseness and make sure the logic is tested on a unit test by the data scientist and use thresholds where necessary if you're using a custom-made model. When it comes to regression testing, so you have to test with different parameters and trying to see the difference in results um, when you're when in results of exploration of a model. So what I mean by this is, when you are trying to do a regression uh, test on a model, always have a, um, a historic run that you have handy, that you ran maybe in the previous sprint or few sprints before, in a major release before, keep that safe. Run a new, um, model for the new uh, release and then compare them and you can automate this to basically see what's different this time from last time and it basically helps you identify trends and use algorithms to anticipate future values as well so that's the that's a good way to do regression testing for models and remember some models have a degree of randomness that doesn't mean that they are um, basically wrong or that doesn't mean that they are an anomaly is just a question of what we accept and what we reject. Obviously, there's no equation for a best answer in the model side of things and rely on a good enough and fast enough result. So in a nutshell, what you should be doing as a tester for testing a model is make sure you have edge case style testing you have model accuracy and precision metrics that you're looking for, and you can have a model that can perform at a scale with new features. So a scalable model and maintainable one. So what about a brand new model? So how do I know my first baseline is right? So when you have a brand new model, you just do one run and you have to rely on those results. So basically, you do a first run with a basic assumption. And we check the logic. And given we're happy with the logic, we have to take it as given, basically. That will be your run, first ever run. So keep those results handy. And then when you have a new release, you can compare it during the regression testing. Another example I'd like to give to you here is example for a manufacturing firm. You can check what they sold last week and check what if the same assumptions were used, then what is an acceptable sale for next week? That's what a model can tell you. So we learned about pre-testing, testing, and now post running a model. What do we do with the results? So we have to have a good enough understanding of what the model has provided and are the predictive analytics working as expected? And does the shape of my data look as expected? So predictive analytics is a buzzword here for you today, um, is the use of data, statistical algorithms, and machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcomes based on historical data. The goal is 
to be to go beyond knowing what has happened to providing the best assessment of what will happen in the future. Some useful questions to think about as a tester as well is what is an acceptable test? So some target results, as you know, might not be what you're expecting. So what's acceptable? It's best to put a threshold in that position. Has my run completed and nothing broke within various stages? So make sure your results are accurate there. No data has been lost. Have we found an anomaly? Is it really an anomaly or is it just a um, stochasticness of my model? Did we drop some data? If we did, where did we drop it? Because we don't want this bug happening again and again. How do we know what we produced is the right result? So some results should not be random, therefore expect the expected results and have confidence levels. So if your confidence levels say to you that in my previous run, this is what came up, this looks potentially right. Have precision from your delta run, so your historic run. And what is an acceptable deviation? Well, when you have thresholds in place, you will know what's accepted and what's rejected. And as I always say, pairing is caring. Make sure you pair up with a data scientist and you share your results with them. So you will also see some complexities. And um, according to them, you will also learn how to um, go about it. So how can we mimic the client data? Right. So whatever the team has decided as a team process, make sure it's followed to be able to test accurately. Um, mimicking client data, an option is to have a golden test data if you have time. But with data science, you have a lot of data. So maybe anonymizing data first may work well. But when there's further files coming in, it might become complex and it may break things. Therefore, a good solution would be to somehow uh, have a golden set if possible. It, um, also, do we create data from scratch and mimic client scenarios? You can do that, but again, time permitting. It takes time to understand a statistical model anyways. Therefore, take time to pair with developers and data scientists to understand what is the problem we are trying to solve. Also, there's important policies to do with data and client data you have to, of course, respect the GDPR rules and make sure that the data that they have given to you is not actually, um, it, it cannot be leaked or anything, or there's some sort of policies and it's been signed for and you're using it after agreeing with your manager. But as I say, to be safe, always either anonymize or create a golden test data with client scenarios embedded in it. Some useful tools that I'd like to share with you. They're very basic, but they, I found them very, very useful. So SQL, learning SQL was really handy because um, doing some queries on the database was really handy to do some comparisons. Statistics, you don't have to be a mathematics pro, but knowing some statistics will really help. Excel, of course, um, everyone loves a bit of Excel. So um, all my data was being copy pasted onto Excel to compare my Delta run versus new run. And then it would identify things that are wrong. Then we automated that process. And DevTools, because my product was front end, um, it was not just about the model, it was more about the accessibility, the look and the feel, the performance and everything. So I would say DevTools are really important as well. So, Understand the data from a business point of view. Don't derail. Make sure we stick to the consumer requirements. Review or analyze specifications, define test scenarios, execute test scripts, review them, report and document if vital. So when we do all of this, we basically are becoming hybrid type of testers because we are not just focusing on our testing skills, but we are bringing in new skills from data science that makes us a hybrid tester. So I know many people have asked me about automation around this area. So even with the advancements in technology, 100% of automation for this kind of area is not achievable. You can automate certain aspects, but the stochasticness, the understanding of the model, what do we want the model to do is something that hasn't been um, done yet. 
So uh, the machine doesn't really understand the calculations I want to perform and I want to verify. Some tips that I'd like you to take away before um, we get onto the Q&A is um, once you have a process within the team, stick to it and look on ways to optimizing it. Document all vital findings and learnings to avoid knowledge silos. Be present in vital meetings, and it's okay not to know everything. There are too many algorithms as is. Ask questions because in my opinion, no question is a silly question. Make sure the model is being tested by testers. Pairing is super useful. Raise your concerns. Make sure new features are being released often and bugs are not repeatable because if bugs are repeatable, your product is not really um, trustworthy. We, we can't really maintain something like that because it's flaky. And be ready to become a mathematics pro when you do all your statistics all the time. So um, these are all the tips. I hope you found my talk interesting. But before I end my talk, um, I just want to say that it's a very new area. Um, loads of testers are not involved in this area. You might have data science in your company. So what I would suggest is always um, try and work together with the data scientists. Don't do testing separately. So shift to the left. If you know your data, if you are working in a data science project, but not working with data scientists, that's a problem. Please pair with them, please find them and work with them so that you can have the optimum quality together as a team rather than just testers doing their testing when the product comes to them. So that's all. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or um, X or Twitter. <laughs> and um, if you want to ask me any more questions, I'm more than happy to have a coffee catch up with you. Thank you, Lambda Test. Thanks, Test You. And over to you, Japneet. Thank you, uh, Lavina, for this uh, insightful session. So uh, we can uh, pick up some questions uh, from, uh, from the Q&A. So uh, let me uh, show the question to you. Oh, wow, there's loads of questions. So how about the volume of uh, data? How do we analyze huge volume of data in a short time? Okay, so of course, you have to kind of use your instincts here. Um, my suggestion would be that um, the thing is, you when you're in a fast paced team, you're not gonna have time to sit and analyze. My suggestion would be to basically take examples from each file, see what the data is like, see if you can mimic it somehow and create your golden set. But um, if it's large uh, volumes, my suggestion would be to uh, pair with a data engineer and understand with them and pair with them on that. Because I wouldn't do these things by myself because it's a new area to explore. If I have an assumption or ambiguity, it's best if I share it with a data engineer. So whenever there's a data science team, there's a data engineer always embedded in that team. So I would suggest please um, work with a data engineer, analyze together. If it's small data set, like I had about 18 files. So I, I would sometimes read uh, the columns and understand like, ah, okay, I get this. And I understand how they kind of join together and I can do my SQL queries. But if it's ginormous, like 50, 60 files, my suggestion there would be Stop analyzing. See if you can pick all the important uh, test scenarios that you're testing, all your edge cases, your important test scenarios. Pick them up and all the bug scenarios. Make a new test data that is only for that client, but internally used for testing. This way, you don't need to ask the client to be sending you high volumes of data because you've already mimicked the important uh, scenarios in your new test data. I hope I've answered that question, Shiv Prasad. Uh, so this is uh, one more interesting question. So what are the specific goals and intended outcomes uh, of the new feature you are introducing to the data science model? OK. So obviously, if there's a new feature, you've already had a chat in your planning session 
um, and refinement sessions of what's expected. So if it's a new feature for the model itself, you have to basically understand what's happening in the model. Is it we are introducing a new algorithm? Are we uh, changing an algorithm we already have? So if we are doing this, what's impacting my model and what is impacting my expected result? So these are the things that you need to kind of focus on and think ahead of time so that when it comes to testing, you know that ah, because of this new feature, my end results have changed, but they're not wrong. It's because the algorithm has slightly been enhanced or a new algorithm has been added. So again, as I say, I do the three amigos session here, Rahul. Um, that's the best thing you can do. Uh, sit down, bring your ambiguities on the plate and discuss them. And when you're making a test plan, I would suggest make a rough one in the three amigo session so that the developer, the business analyst and yourself are on the same boat rather than the developer some thinking something else. You are thinking something else and everyone's confused. Okay. So uh, uh, one question that uh, that has come to my mind, uh, Lavina. So uh, like how we uh, test for overfitted or underfitted models. So how we cater to that specific situation. So like the model is there, but it's not fit for purpose or it's doing too good. Yeah, like it is. It's, it's fitted, it. And it is fitted very well for the sample data set, but it is not doing well for uh, like, uh, the generic data set or the data that will be coming for predictions. OK, so I think that comes down to um, what model you've actually implemented. If it's a custom made model, then um, there's something that the data scientist and the data engineer need to work on, because if it's giving you 50 50 options in your head, we are not providing quality for this product because we are not sure ourselves. However, if it's off the shelf, my suggestion would be to speak to the, the company that has provided this to you and then explain the problem to them and see how you can reach midpoints to say that, OK, now I understand what's expected of me as a tester and what's expected of this model at the end of the day. But um, I've never come across such situation, Japneet. I don't know. Have, have you come across this? That's a new one for me. Yeah, so uh, like I came across this while uh, like uh, making some models. So that is when I have faced this uh, kind of uh, situation. Huh. OK. OK, so then what did you do in that case? So it, it is uh, more about like uh, when the uh, like uh, the overfitting actually happens when uh, like we are providing two specific data set and the features that we are selecting for any model are like very specific to that problem and they are not generalizing the answers. So basically they will right. give uh, like they, they will give you direct A to B mapping and not a generic mapping. Uh, if you give uh, like A dash to the model, it will not point to B and it will just uh, like uh, know your case so that okay is we'll just yeah. thinks it, it is right okay yeah so i think it's a question of training your model right like yes. sometimes when i was in my team um if you overrun the model it gives you vague answers so right. there's there's certain times where you should just train it set in a certain manner and not overdo it because then if you're overdoing it you're getting something that's completely out of bounds so then i think it's it's just playing around with it and understanding as a team uh what's actually the right outcome here so we have one more uh, interesting question so delving into the evolution of testing what significance does the emergence of is dates hold for the future so i think this is more related to the changing and uh, like how the AI is changing uh, the industry. So, yeah. Yeah. Even though AI is changing the industry, um, I must say this, testers will still be required. AI cannot do everything, like the look and the feel, uh, have the different thinking hats of a tester. So you will be there and you are needed there, right? Uh, so don't ever worry about that. But the emergence of SDETs, I think, um, will be really useful in this team because as i said uh, certain aspects can be automated certain can't so now the the challenge here is the bit that can't be automated are there any potential ways of automating it in the future i think yes there are ways just that right now we can't see it but i'm sure we can in the future so i definitely think 
as debts in the future will be required. And if they're not in these teams right now, I think we should embed them because it's not just about manually testing these models and understanding all of this. I think it's good to always have some sort of automation. It doesn't have to be automating the model. It can be just automating previous versus current results and checking how, how they differ. It can be uh, automating some front-end scenarios of this model. We don't have to automate the model. There's potentially a front-end site that the client sees. So we definitely need uh, SDETs there as well. So um, do not worry, uh, you will always be required. So I think it is more about uh, the uh, like updation. So if we keep on updating with the industry, I think uh, like nobody will lose the relevance, but we have to stay relevant uh, with the uh, like we need to update ourselves uh, according to Up the industry trends. Yes, we need to upskill ourselves 100%. Right. I think uh, you can't be in the tech industry and not upskill yourself. I think yeah. then there's no point of being in tech. Uh, every minute there's a new product coming out, a new program, something's coming out. So then it's always important to uh, stay up to date. Yeah. So uh, there is one more question. What are the typical metrics to be measured against the testing outcomes? Okay, so uh, with data science, you won't have metrics like, um, I don't know, like currently I work with metrics and there's like bugs um, tested or uh, things like that. Um, what is it? Um, percentage of automation coverage and things like that. So I think in the data science world, what you can do is bring them. So bring your testing suitcase that you already have now and try and somehow play with it to give you some sort of metrics. I'll be very honest, I didn't have no metrics in, in my time at this project because it wasn't something that we were looking into. But thinking of it now, you can definitely do pick up data from the dashboards, like uh, the type of bugs that we are raising, uh, analyze these bugs, uh, try and see the repeatability of certain bugs. Um, if you're automating, try and see um, how much uh, test coverage there is. That would be an important kind of uh, metric to have. I I personally would have some metrics, but not overdo with metrics. Um, it's only if like higher management wants to see certain things, then focus on what they want to see. But um, at the end of the day, what are we as a team, we are basically delivering quality. So right. pick pick metrics that will showcase these qualities. Don't pick metrics that are like how many bugs were raised in this sprint, because that's not really a great metric. Pick metrics like if there were bugs raised, what are the what are the what's the percentage of um basically the time between it got raised versus retesting it? and delivering it into the uh, environment. So think things like that. So there is, uh, this is uh, again, I think on the similar lines, how can we ensure the quality of data science model and gain confidence in its performance? Are there any specific techniques used this? So I said uh, confidence level. So uh, once you start running this model, um, you'll understand what it's doing, what's the story behind it, what are you trying to solve for your customer? So I think um, obviously use predictive analytics if you can uh, do some distributions, try and understand the right data set, uh, what's anomaly, what's a derivation, for example. And then um, when you basically start running these models, you automatically gain confidence that, aha, uh -huh, this looks right. I have compared it to my Delta run. It, it is very similar. So we can actually release this. But ah, oops, this doesn't look right to me because the Delta run suggested this versus this run suggesting this. So maybe my parameters are wrong or something. But check these things and uh, set a triage and then take it to the data scientists to verify because they can be your last check and see what differences were there and see the distribution layers um, and, um, level, sorry, and understand what could have gone wrong. And if it has gone wrong, why that algorithm has failed this time. So that's the way I would say, um, you're, you're never gonna learn all the algorithms by heart. You don't have to. Uh, my suggestion is understand what you're trying to do, understand what you're trying to deliver mainly understand the problem statement. Once you understand that, you will basically start gaining confidence of what actually 
I'm performing, right? And in terms of performance of this model, you can play around, you can explore by adding different parameters. You can add high ranges, you can add lower ranges, you can have mid ranges if you have parameters and see how the model performs because that also teaches you what my parameters are making this model do essentially and this way you will also learn what are the anomalies where this model really messes up so play around with it explore it as much as possible and i think that should give you enough confidence of what's a right model result versus what's a, a bad result so uh, i think this question is more in line with like people who want to go into this field so uh, i think this is more in line with that is yeah, this based I think on r or python Python. Python is the big thing right now. Um, I'm not saying you have to learn it um, fully. Have some knowledge when you're going to sit down with developers or data scientists, they will showcase um, their code to you. What I used to do is whenever they had unit tests, I would tell them, talk to me like you're telling me a story about this unit test, and then I'll understand it better. And they used to do that. And it, it was better. And then I started getting an idea of, yes, I know what this code is doing. And also in code review sessions, tell the data scientist to add you as a second reviewer. Even though you're not a Python pro, looking at it, going over it with the data scientist gives you enough um, sort of learning that you know what's going in to this um, repository. That's what I would suggest. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we have answered most of the questions and uh, like for, for the uh, questions which are still unanswered, you can find the Lambda Test community link in the chat section. You can visit the community and our experts and speakers will be uh, like, uh, will be helping you uh, find the best answer for your question. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Lavina, for the delightful uh, session. We surely learned a lot from the session and your insights are really I also want to remind uh, the attendees that these sessions uh, were recorded and will be available on Lambda's YouTube channel. So you can watch again and share it with your peers. So thank you, Alavina, once again. And have a great day and happy testing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.